Hi, this is Brian Dolan from the law firm Pepper Hamilton. On September 29th, 2015, Pepper partner Greg Novak presented a webinar to West Legal Ed Center. For this webinar, Mr. Novak was joined by his fellow partner, Tim McTaggart, and Walt Donaldson, Managing Director with Free Group International Solutions. This webinar discussed FinCEN's proposal to extend the anti-money laundering regulations to SEC registered investment advisors. This session provided a roadmap for the new FinCEN proposed rule and how you can make a difference in shaping the eventual final rule and its effect on the industry. This podcast is a recording of that webinar. If you visit the Insight Center on Pepper's website at www.pepperlaw.com, where this podcast is posted, you'll find the PowerPoint slides for the session. We hope you enjoy this podcast. West Legal Ed Center would like to welcome you to today's program, Investment Management Update, the latest news and developments on funds, regulations, and investing trends for September. Thank you for joining us, and I will now turn things over to our speakers for further introductions. Good afternoon. This is Greg Novak from Pepper Hamilton. Uh, I'm a partner in our financial services group out of the Philadelphia and New York offices, and I'm joined today by my partner, Tim McTaggart who's also in the financial services group and is um, one of our commercial banking um, regulatory specialists. So um, without further ado, we'd like to get into our program today. As most of you know, the U.S. Department of the Treasury Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, affectionately known as FinCEN, uh, published a notice of proposed rulemaking on September 1, 2015, that would impose any money laundering requirements for investment advisors that are registered or required to be registered with the Securities and, Ex- Securities and Exchange Commission and effectively bring such SEC registered investment advisors under the Bank Secrecy Act. So uh, first question for Tim. Tim, why all of a sudden, uh, after FinCEN had withdrew a prior proposal, have we seen this resurface? No, that's a good good question, uh, Greg. Uh, you know, they went to some length to uh, talk about um, the changes uh, in the Dodd Frank Act and uh, some of the perhaps technical or other policy difficulties they were having when they looked at this. Uh, you know, actually, it's, 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 you know, like 2002 to 2003, and they fussed around with it, and then finally in 2008 uh, abandoned uh, the effort. Um, so from the from the S, you know, SEC's perspective, and now through FinCEN's you know, driving of this, uh, in some respects, I guess they see the uh, the regulatory framework being uh, more accommodating, so that you know accommodating to them, not accommodating to the regulators. <laughs> right. So the investment advisors for hedge funds and private equity shops, you know, are registered. That simplifies uh, the way they're. They're uh, looking at uh, who should be covered uh, with the anti-money laundering uh, requirements and, and the like. I, I guess, though, uh, as a longtime practitioner in the investment advisory arena, I'm still puzzled as to why uh, FinCEN believes that there is a risk here. And let me put my puzzlement into context. Most investment advisors, if, if not all investment advisors, take umbrage at the notion that they have custody of anything because they just never touch currency. They never touch checks. They may have legal custody, which is a um, sort of a penumbra that the SEC has crafted on top of the notion of what is custody. And uh, I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with my clients who say, um, what do you mean I have custody? And I, well, you're the general partner of a fund, therefore the SEC views that, that you have legal custody of the assets. And they say, that's just not true. I can't move that money. The contracts I have with the banks would probably prevent me from doing that. And so it has caused an enormous amount of confusion. And the reason I bring that up is the reason why most investment managers feel that this is overkill is because there's always a bank involved. There's always a broker involved. When money moves with an investment advisor, it moves between bank accounts, and you know you can't get a better gold-plated standard for uh, any money laundering compliance than the banks. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I guess uh, not to be flippant, but one answer is that there's 62 trillion reasons why there's <laughs> 62 trillion in, in assets, which uh, it certainly freaks out um, FinCEN. 
Uh, look, FinCEN hasn't articulated a strong policy defense or vision for, for this uh, in, in the following way. It's not like in, in a classic manner there are uh, uh, difficult scenarios that they have run across and they are saying, look, we need to go and proceed with this type of rule because this would have helped us when we tried to do this in this case or you know, two so years ago. So in fact, there's no reference to those instances in the in the proposal. No, I mean, in, in that way, I would you know argue it's, it's a deficient record. Uh, and quite frankly, one of the reasons uh, why uh, industry uh, and, and other interested parties ought to be you know commenting uh, to uh, to fill this out. I mean, um, you know, there's uh, another side of it, which is, um, you know, FinCEN is conducting various uh, investigations. Uh, this proposed rule obviously opens up a wide range of documents that can contribute even more investigative leads for them, and they very well may think that they're going to, uh, you know, unearth or break some some cases that uh, are uh, not known to them at, at this point. To your point about the banks, uh, and I agree, I mean, a lot of this is, is overkill. A lot of this, when you look at it from a risk-based standpoint, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so you, we have a proverbial square peg round hole. There's no currency, so you don't you know, there's a currency reporting requirement, but probably it's not uh, going to be triggered in, in many, many instances, as you, uh, uh, you know, point out. But, uh, and with the point about the banks, though, uh, you know, what's envisioned, what FinCEN, you know, their view of the world is, well, that'll just be the bank and the RIA and potentially, if necessary, the broker-dealer doing a joint, uh, you know, suspicious activities report. Or, you know, they, they will work in tandem in some fashion to fulfill these regulatory requirements. That doesn't take care of all the paperwork and reporting requirements that are imposed upon the RIA, but in terms of like, you know, SARS and some of the other you know, requirements that come along, I mean, the, the fin, FinCEN you know, view of the world is, well, then sure, they'll, they'll work in some joint fashion. But right now, um, primary reporters on SARS, these are suspicious activity reports, like banks and brokerage firms, have a shield. They cannot be, um, sued by the subject of the SAR because uh, there's an actual statutory shield. Will advisors have enjoy a similar protection? That's the expectation. I mean, there's some technical issues in terms of uh, maintaining the, the SAR confidentiality, and there's some uh, comment uh, sought to uh, allow for sharing of SAR information within the same cor corporate organization in a way that is possible within you know, a banking uh, organization. So there's some, um, you know, mechanics, so to speak, that have to be, you know, worked through. But the, the shield should uh, should carry through. Yeah, we, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but just since we mentioned them, briefly, Tim, give us what exactly is a SAR, um, when would it be, uh, or now banks actually using them, and um, what are the limitations on the sharing that you mentioned? Well, suspicious activities reports, uh, I was actually counseled for the Senate Banking Committee uh, when uh, the Anunzio Wiley bill was passed that put SARS into the, uh, into the uh, U.S. code. Uh, who knows if uh, those uh, members of Congress had any idea what, you know, was uh, going to, uh, you know, spew forth, uh, you know, when that was done in 1992. Um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a threshold. It's, it's a 5K you know, threshold, um, you know, there is a, a range of um, uh, activities that uh, banks and now, you know, RIAs are supposed to be uh, familiarizing themselves with. Uh, there's a, a series of kind of examples of red flags that uh, FinCEN has put into the, into the rule uh, that would uh, be so egregious in their mind that it would, of course, have to generate a source. So, for example, uh, if there were a uh, investment client that was completely oblivious or uninterested in, you know, the uh, rate of return or the, you know, the risk uh, versus uh, rate trade-off, and was just looking to, you know, essentially set up an account, regardless of what kind of financial return you know, might uh, arise in connection with that account. Hello, wait a minute. That could be used to describe anyone who invests in treasuries or European government bonds right now, where uh, instruments issued by the European Central Bank are 
being uh, paid negative interest rates. No doubt, but I think there's a business reason for those uh, those accounts. Which but is, does that trigger an SAR? Uh, not just in and of itself, no. But I mean, if there was some other uh, framework around it that suggested that there wasn't a business use of this this account and it was just being used, you know, as a as a conduit. That's that's the theory, at least for you know, for FinCEN. So tell me a little bit about the confidentiality that uh, is attended to the use of the SAR or the filing of the SAR. Um, my understanding is they cannot be shared with anybody. You can't even acknowledge the existence of the SAR or that you've actually filed an SAR. The way the proposal is structured, that that is correct. Uh, there is a little wiggle room, as I was alluding to, where you know, FinCEN's anticipating that, um, let's just use the word, duly registered uh, enterprises or entities that are you know, subject to uh, SAR uh, reporting, such as a bank and an RIA and a uh, broker dealer, they could jointly, you know, respond. Presumably, you know, it would be a facts and circumstances arrangement where they all sort of came to the knowledge of this suspicious activity, uh, you know, at the same same time. You know, query as to whether that's you know realistic and exactly how that's going to work. But the way it's set up now, there's less flexibility i.e. like no flexibility otherwise for sharing the information uh, within the RIA uh, corporate you know, corporate structure as a, as a routine matter. All right. So the impact of the proposed rule, covered RIAs would need to file currency transaction reports and maintain records relating to the transmittal of funds. So let's talk about that for a second. They're talking here about cash currency, not the transmittal of funds by way of a wire transfer, for example. Well, it's it's a combination, right? So for CTRs, it's it's currency. It's 10k um, in currency, and the, you know they they go to great. Again, this all may be moot given the points that you made at the top of the hour, Craig. In terms of there's really not cash you know going through. I mean, so it's just like uh, uh, imagine you know imaginary uh, 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 activity to a certain extent. But there is this requirement if there's you know 10k in in currency. On the uh, on the BSA you know travel side um, you know it's uh, funds dispersal of uh, 3k uh, and then um, uh, you know there are other uh, instruments that can be picked up beyond the currency which would be you know monetary instruments checks investment securities and, and so forth. So um, an investment advisor arranges for the uh, custodian of a institutional client's bank bank account, right, to wire funds from the bank account directly to the client's bank account. What reporting needs to happen there? Um, is, that a, is that a transport issue under the Bank Secrecy Act? I mean, again, if it's, you know, it very well may be. Uh, okay, audience, it seems a little bizarre to me because now we've affected everyday transactions in the business where no one's touched currency, where you already have reporting entities, namely banks involved or brokerage firms, and uh, the RIA is simply saying, move it from this account to that account where everybody's already reported. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a record-keeping, you know, obligation that is a check-the-box thing. Um, okay, so it also provides that covered RIAs would become subject to BSA rules and certain portions of the U.S. Patriot Act. Patriot Act. So, Give us a highlight. What are we talking about? Um, there are um, provisions in the in the Patriot Act that uh, permit voluntary uh, sharing of, of information uh, with um, with law enforcement. Uh, there's also uh, other instances where um, there's a mandatory um, uh, requirements for sharing of information uh, with uh, with law enforcement. Uh, there are other parts. Of the Patriot Act, uh, which uh, to, to this point uh, the FinCEN has um, uh, has reserved uh, and has stated that they may revisit uh, some of those other requirements. For example, uh, 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 relationships with correspondent banks and some of the uh, need for record keeping on service of process in the in the country for correspondent banking relationships. That that is not in this rule. But there are other parts of the Patriot Act that uh, uh, will be studied and possibly subject to uh, joint uh, 
you know, SEC, FinCEN, uh, you know, rule. So under uh, uh, what is in the rule, uh, it's, you know, 314A and 314B of the Patriot Act. 314B allows, you know, the covered entities to voluntar voluntarily share information uh, with other financial institutions subject to uh, AML program requirements to identify and report activities that may involve money laundering or terrorist activity. Um, you know, when sharing information, financial institutions will receive protections from civil liability, and then there are certain annual reports that they need to make with um, uh, with FinCEN. Um, under 314A, uh, there's, again, it's not voluntary. It's a question of uh, uh, FinCEN mandating, uh, you know, covered RIA search for records to identify, you know, accounts or transactions of named persons, uh, you know, so it's sort of like a, uh, essentially like a subpoena, you know, from, from FinCEN. All right, so let's talk about the scope of the proposed rule. Um, it only apply, applies to, quote, unquote, large advisors um, unless the mid-sized or small-sized advisors are in states that do not examine mid-sized or small advisors, which currently is Wyoming and New York. So if you're an advisor in New York, you have more than $25 million under management, then you are considered a mid-sized advisor and required to register with the SEC as a registered investment advisor, and now you are a covered advisor subject to these rules. Correct. Okay. Now, of course, the other exception that um, our good friends Dodd and Frank gave us were the $150 million uh, private fund only manager exception, the SBIC only exception, and the venture capital manager only exception, where under the Dodd-Frank amendments, if that's all you do, uh, regardless of the assets you have as an SBIC or a venture firm or for private funds under 150, you're not required to register federally. That is correct. And so the, the, the SEC registration is, uh, you know, is, the, is the trigger. Um, begs the question, uh, which I'm anticipating from you, <laughs> which would be what happens if someone voluntarily registered if they didn't meet these parameters otherwise? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, again, having worked with a number of uh, new advisors through the registration process, if you tick the box that you want to be registered and that you're going to meet the status within 120 days, if you don't meet it on the 122nd day, you're getting a phone call from the SEC saying, we want you to deregister. So um, voluntarily registering with the SEC now is difficult unless you are a multi-state advisor or you're some form of publisher that can fit within one of the other statuses for registration. The Dodd-Frank assets under management test for the run-of-the-mill advisor are very bright line. Yeah, so let me make uh, a couple uh, points on the voluntary side because, quite frankly, we do see that on day-to-day, on -day, uh, as you're describing and, and otherwise. So if you... If you have managed, uh, for whatever business purpose, separate and apart from this uh, proposal, to be, become registered on a voluntary basis with the SEC, um, you, know, you will become subject to this rule once it is uh, uh, finalized. A, a separate point is what about uh, you know, RIAs that, apart from this rule, uh, have put in voluntary compliance programs that mimic or anticipate um, uh, AML arrangements, either because you know they're duly registered with a broker dealer um, or some other, you know, for some other reason. And, and the answer, of course, is uh, just because they are a kind of ahead of the game from the regulator standpoint and have a voluntary AML program in place and it's functioning and doing well, doesn't mean that it will be uh, grandfathered in or anything like that. I mean, those programs will have to abide by these rules you know, once they are finished and, and uh, finalized. So, um, um, you know, uh, there may be a, a need for them to revisit, uh, uh, you know, so first principles on some of those programs. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the parameters of the, uh, of the proposed rule. Um, let's talk about customer identification. Would an RIA need to have a customer identification program known as KYC? The simple answer now is no. Uh, the more uh, sort of realistic, pragmatic answer is it's pretty it, – let me just explain the no. I mean, FinCEN has said that they're not requiring 
customer identification program, CIP, you know, or KYC, know your customer uh, requirements. Uh, they have expressly said that they're looking to do a joint rulemaking with the SEC in due course on that on that point. Uh, so that's not that it's no forever, but uh, it's it's no for the time being and until they turn to it with this joint rulemaking effort. Having said all that, um, it's pretty hard to uh, imagine and think through uh, the AML programs which uh, have the risk-based components and differentiation among the different types of investment clients and other such arrangements without having some you know, element and uh, you know, sort of attributes that you know start to look like a, a CIP uh, program. So um, I think the reality is that um, as clients uh, move in this direction to uh, prepare themselves for this rule, and then once the rule is finalized, to uh, to implement and, and bring themselves into compliance, uh, there's going to need to be certain uh, efforts undertaken, probably uh, towards a CIP-like. Um, uh, response, you know, even before it becomes a formal requirement. Well, let's let's you know talk turkey here. Uh, I have not seen a subscription agreement for a private fund uh, prepared by our firm or any other firm in the past 15 years that does not already have um, three to four pages of representations and uh, identifying information that we get from our clients. Number one, number or from the investors. Number two, um, we already do OFAC clearance to make sure that we're not dealing with a person of interest. Um, number three, you can't open a bank account. And if you're opening an account and you don't have this information for the investors in a particular account, the bank generally won't open the account. So uh, unless they know that you have a robust KYC program already in place. So, again, this seems to be mandating what already is happening in the industry simply because the realities of opening an account with a bank or a brokerage firm are such that you already have to do this. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, uh, just one technical point on the OFAC. The OFAC requirement applies to every, you know, business in America. So it's not specifically... uh, Financially related or specifically related to this uh, uh, to this rule. So uh, you know, at any point, any time, the uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control, specially designated persons list. That's something that uh, uh, you're in business. You're supposed to be checking, uh, and so that that carries on and, and carries uh, that carries through. But you're you're you know, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you that um, uh, the reality is, given uh, the way uh, banks have. Um, Responded to their uh, requirements, uh, it's it's going to uh, you know force uh, this type of information to be uh, uh, developed and, and, and presented already in many many respects. Okay, um, so let's move on now. Let's talk a little bit about the CTR reporting requirements. Uh, Tim, what are the CTR reporting requirements for covered at RIAs under the proposed rule? Well, the the thing that the rule uh, wants to make clear is that uh, currently there are um, uh, requirements under Form uh, 8300 uh, to report transactions, you know, more than $10,000 in in cash. Uh, The CTR would replace that uh, Form 8300 uh, requirement. So, you know, our covered RA is obligated to file that are obligated to file the CTR is still needing to file the Form 8300? No. Um, uh, the FinCEN goes to some length uh, in their, you know, requests for additional questions and, and, and like to try to figure out, you know, what impact that, that might have. Um, but um, uh, the idea is that the, the, the currency transaction reporting requirements will supplant uh, the Form 8300 uh, requirements. So, Covered RIAs will be required to file CTRs with FinCEN for any transaction involving a payment or transfer of more than ten thousand uh, in currency, you know, by, through, or to uh, the covered RIA. Okay. Well, let's talk about the by, through, or to. Um, ten thousand dollars in currency to a covered RIA. As I said earlier, 
you know, uh, unless maybe you're an RIA working in Colorado or Washington and you're dealing with the the, the nascent um, cash economy there um, that's been brought about by um, the legalization of marijuana, uh, you're very unlikely to see an RIA accept currency. I agree. It's just not going to happen. But what exactly does it mean by through? Does it mean it has to go into the balance sheet of the covered RIA, where they would actually accept the currency and then, you know, credit somehow an account of the investor? I mean, I think it's intended to be broadly construed. So, I mean, uh, you know, if the if the RIA is, is touching it or some fashion serving as a conduit, whether it's on its balance sheet or, or otherwise, I think it's uh, expected to uh, trigger the, the, uh, the filing. But it is just currency. Correct. It is just currency, not checks. For this requirement, correct. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the BSA record-keeping requirements. And is it just the record-keeping of the BSA that we have to worry about? Um, record-keeping requirements under the BSA? Uh, are there other BSA rules that we need to be worried about? Um, there's, I mean, the people shorthand it and call the, the travel regs as well as uh, the record-keeping regs. Okay. All right. So what BSA record-keeping requirements are applicable? Um, as I mentioned uh, you know, at the top of the hour, uh, for transmittal funds of uh, 3,000 or more, uh, covered RIAs must create and retain the records regarding each transmittal to the next financial institution in the payment chain. Uh, additionally, the proposed rule would require there are covered RIAs to create and retain records for extensions of credit, cross-border transfers of currency, credit, monetary instruments, checks, investment securities that amount to more than 10K. So let's, let's talk about the first one, which is um, you must keep records regarding a $3,000 payment of each transmittal to the next financial institution in the payment chain. So explain that to me. Are we talking about any payment of a bill of more than $3,000? Yes. And what do these records look like? I mean, did you copy the canceled check, for example? Uh, you know, or the wire transfer. Probably wire, more wire transfer log, right? Okay. Yeah. And uh, similarly, the... Uh, I mean, it's a computer run, right? Right. Yeah, so it's, you know, looking at all transfers grid in 3K. I mean, obviously, you know, um, uh, much of this compliance is driven by specialized software processes. And, um, you know, after, you know, being tested and vetted by internal audit and, uh, you know, other uh, experts. Um, and then it's, you know, checking up on it on an ongoing basis to make sure that there aren't transactions that have somehow slip through uh, from the compliance perspective, uh, you know, these, these requirements. But, yeah, it, it would be uh, you know, sufficient detail about the, uh, about the wire, most likely. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And also, we're required to retain and um, create records for the extension of credit. Now, a broker is known, I mean, part of their business is to provide margin loans, et cetera, off of their balance sheet, so they've extended credit. Um, and I have heard of circumstances, I think the, the government has actually identified certain where brokerage margin loans were, you know, used as a device for, uh, for money laundering and transmitting outside of the scope of the war and attempted outside of the scope of the rules. But again, most asset managers if they extend credit, they're not extending it off of their balance sheet. It's the fund that they manage that buys a loan, for example, or um, makes a loan. You know, some some funds are uh, outside of the banking system in the sense that they are not they are non bank lenders, or they buy bonds or, or other credit that has been issued by a bank. So, does this cover? the extension of credit of a fund managed by the RIA or only off of the RIA's own balance sheet? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I think the intent is uh, off of the balance sheet, but that certainly, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense to uh, uh, bring a, uh, a comment forward 
uh, on uh, you know on that on that point. Um, again, this is a little bit of the uh, taking the framework that's uh, out there, and it may not really fit comfortably over the practices uh, in the RIA uh, business. Yeah, and and again, I, I think everybody needs to focus on the fact that when it says a covered RIA would also be required to create and retain records of extensions of credit and cross-border transfers of currency, credit, monetary instruments, checks, and investment securities, again, very little of this ever happens on the balance sheet of the RIA. You know, if there's going to be a transfer of currency, it's in the mutual fund that the RIA manages or the separate account for the XYZ pension plan held at ABC Custody Bank that's going to move money offshore because they're buying an offshore security with a foreign brokerage firm. Um, but in every one of these instances, the RIA is acting as an agent for a disclosed principal, right? Their client. And if, if the RIA is required to keep those records, that's a gargantuan task. I mean, that's their entire business. If, on the other hand, they're focused just on the extension of credit or the movement of funds off of the RIA's own balance sheet, that's a different story. And that seems to be something where you know, there may actually be a plug, you know, a hold the plug, but not on the other side where banks and brokerage firms are already involved. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a fair point. All right. Um, we've just been joined by a, a good friend of Pepper Hamilton, uh, Mr. Walt Donaldson, whose uh, uh, bio is in your materials. Um, Walt is a managing director of the Free Group. And Walt, you want to say a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, good afternoon. Sorry I'm late. Oh, well, you know. Uh, Today, uh, planes, planes and automobiles did not work in my favor. Well, we're all going to be on a Pope vacation, or we're going to be blaming Pope traffic for the next. Uh... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, my background is I retired um, in 2010 as the uh, global director for. Um, investigations for Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Um, there I had responsibility for, you know, um, several hundred investigators around the world in, in many countries. Um, we focused on both internal fraud as well as external um, fraud as it related to the products that Bank of America Merrill Lynch offered uh, to its customers. So I've seen a, a lot of that and I've worked in that field for the past 35 years. Um, that's kind of at a high level, but I've done a lot of work in security um, investigations and compliance. So really what I joined you today was I have a little bit of a background with uh, working on BSA requirements for AML programs for both financial institutions, money service businesses, and casinos, which up until now are the primary targets. Um, so, you know, it's talking about, and I kind of think that leads into your next slide here, uh, really is you have AML program requirements. Um, so if you think about what an AML program is, before you can even um, build an AML program, you really need to have an independent risk assessment done. One that you can start with, which your internal audit provision may have already performed or should have already performed, um, but you would have what is an independent risk assessment? Where are the regulatory, reputational, and all of the risks that each of you will face um, and then build, that kind of becomes the framework on how you build an AML program. The AML program really has what's referred to in the industry as the four pillars. And what the four pillars are is really to establish policies and procedures and, and really understand and document. If it's not documented, then it's not done. Um, to document the internal controls um, that are in place and, uh, you know, all of the mitigating factors that each of you will do to and perform to ensure that they're being adhered to. Um, so it's really designed to identify um, potential money laundering schemes, um, and that's some of it's a little bit difficult to explain to individuals who don't have anything in place today because some of it's software driven, driven, some of it's uh, human driven. Um, in, in terms of looking at trends and analysis of, of data that's going out. Um, as part of that pillar, you have to be independently tested um, on an annual basis. Well, they say periodically, I think it is in the regulation is the way it's defined. Um, my experience with uh, regulators has been that really is dependent upon the size of the institution and what they have in total assets. That's really what kind of drives them. 
Okay, so let me give you a for instance. Let's say we have an asset manager that has a grand total of 20 employees, maybe $10 million on its balance sheet, um, but it's managing, um, I don't know, uh, $4 billion of pension money, private funds, mutual funds, uh, government accounts, mm -hmm. right? So uh, up to this point in time, they have relied on the banks and the brokerage firms where the money is actually held and the custod and the custodian, the, whoever the custodians are of the various funds, et cetera, um, and their AML programs. Now, they have an AML program in place mainly on the client intake side where they review who the client is and they do the KYC and they mm -hmm. – make the money sit for a while in an escrow account at a bank before it gets transferred into any type of fund. And what's the purpose of it sitting for a few days so that the bank can do its AML program? So what are we layering on top here? What exactly does the RIA have to do under these, under these four pillars? Well, in, in many instances, it's a duplication of efforts. I mean, you know, every time you send a wire, and I'll just use a very basic example of a wire, and every bank or correspondent bank or anyone that it goes through performs the exact same function. They're looking for trends. They're looking for um, other banks that may have transferred the funds. They're determining whether or not the, um, the sender or the beneficiary, the originator or the beneficiary are actually, you know, on any sanctions list. I and mean, there's a lot of different things that they're doing, all of which kind of falls down the road of BSA, AML, that compliance. Um, so this is not greatly different than what the other banks are already doing. Um, in terms of the periodic testing, it's something that, you know, for a, a bank of the asset size that you described, it, you know, it's probably not going to be done any greater than once every 18 or 24 months at the most, unless there was a significant change to the organization, to the offerings, and to, or to the control environment. That's really what would drive that independent assessment more than anything else. Um, banks and the others that you've described as a third pillar to this all have a BSA or OFAC officer, um, which is the designated person, um, or in some cases a committee that's responsible to ensure that you know, policies are being adhered to, um, they're being complied with, and that the actual desktop procedures that are in place in all of the operating areas are functioning as expected, um, you know, which kind of goes to the last pillar, which the last pillar is really the, uh, the training of your employees. And, and whether you have 10 employees or, you know, 1,000 employees, um, every one of them from the lowest level through the board of directors is required to attend training on an annual basis. Um, and it has to be, again, one of these things documented is not only in your AML program as, uh, you know, as part of it, as a policy that supports that program, but it would then be documented on that annual basis on who, in, who was in attendance and who was not. So basically what we're saying is everyone comes in and we say, one, don't take cash. <laughs> Two, make sure that you know who your customer is. And uh, before you get all excited about cashing your commission check, you know, we have to make sure the person meets AML and OFAC and all your other KYC requirements. Uh, number three, um, only have relationships with correspondent banks and brokerage firms that you have assurance have robust AML programs, right? Yeah, on, on, on that point, um, and not to turn it on its head, but uh, you can – pretty well rest assured that all the correspondent banks will have robust AML programs. The, the more practical issue is whether people exit uh, functioning as a correspondent bank. I mean, they, you know, it kind of it can fluctuate. There's certain uh, business decision that may be made that uh, they're not going to wish to have accounts from certain geographies or certain types of uh, you know, sized uh, enterprises or enterprises from certain you know, uh, parts of the world, all, all that kind of thing. So the, the correspondent banking issue is a real issue. I think um, it's the tail wagging the dog in terms of the uh, uh, what they're you know what they have. They they, they sh you know uh, it's very high, highly unlikely that you have a correspondent bank that wasn't you know completely up to speed on the on the AML requirements. The, the more again to emphasize the point, you know, you might have had four choices. Uh, now you might only have one. You know, it's, it's that kind of problem that the clients see 
over and over so again. So you're saying we're going to see financial intermediaries opting out of the business simply because they don't want to take the risk? They're not necessarily opting out of it completely. But but opting out with you. Yes, exactly. And, and, that, and from, from your perspective, that's completely. Exactly. Right. But yes, I mean, they're, you know, uh, and again, some of it is uh, what other uh, pressures, uh, and some of it may be AML related on that particular financial institution that is doing the correspondent banking. They may pull back a little bit until they, you know, sort that out and settle it and, and, and get, you know, get on onto it. Or it may be something that they see from one of their competitors. And then they, you know, sort of pull back and they reassess. Uh, before they, uh, you know, either continue in the marketplace uh, or you know, make other other business choices. All right. We also have uh, that the AML program must be approved in writing by the board of directors or trustees or similar functioning body. Presumably, the board of directors of the advisor is going to have to um, have uh, special counsel to advise them on whether or not the program that's been adopted by the company of which they are in charge is uh, yeah. meeting the requirements? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the board ultimately is going to have responsibility. So they need to ensure that it has all of the adequate policies, procedures, and everything that support an overall program. Um, it's the policies, the procedures, the education, you know, uh, the internal controls, all of which are the infrastructure and build up to the program. So they need to have an understanding or at least the, you know, um, the confidence level in senior management's understanding of what the control environment is so that they can sign off and approve it. And then if there's any changes or, as I said earlier, if you have any change in an offering or a, a process or you have a systems change, um, you know, that is going to affect what your AML program is, what your control environment is. So, again, it would have to require that sign-off. But, I mean, as part of that sign-off, it, it's got the documentation, everything's in place. Um, and as part of that, and I think it leads into where your next requirement here is, is um, making sure that you have, as part of your program, um, a means to document suspicious activity as well as activity that may have alerted potentially as suspicious but was cleared. So all of that needs to be part of what they're signing off on. So not only do I keep my SARs, I also have to keep a record of the fact that we thought this may have been an SAR-worthy event, but we decided not to because, and the because, why, right. why we decided not to file. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, if this is an interesting um, topic because it doesn't speak much about customer due diligence or CDD or enhanced due diligence, EDD, but it's something that is a part of every AML program, and really without it, um, it, it makes it impossible to um, to respond to an alert, to have, um, you know, some of the functionality that Tim talked about is automated, the different programs that are layered on your system to identify potentially suspicious activity. And those activities will vary based on your work with either the software developer or your in-house compliance uh, experts uh, and your operations individuals. Uh, because they will drive and build out alerts that will identify types of activity with customers. Um, those alerts then have to be responded to by someone internally, essentially investigated. And that's a part of enhanced due diligence to understand the source of the funds as well as who the beneficiary is, where it's going, et cetera. Um, and all of that has to be documented um, for, uh, for potentially, a, number one, a suspicious activity reporting, um, which if you do file the suspicious activity report, you are mandated to maintain it for at least 60 months, part of record retention. Um, you'd have only 30 days in which to file it. There are provisions where that can be extended out to 60 days for continuing investigation and identifying an individual. Um, and then uh, even in the instances, and this is where the regulators have really um, come across uh, in, a, in a firm manner over the past 24 months, I'll say, and um, have, have caused some issue with a lot of different financial institutions, and that is the investigation that you may perform on an alert that does not uh, require the filing of a SAR. Um, what they are looking for is the documentation, your investigative notes, and the rationale and the decision-making process that you use uh, in determining to not file the SAR. Okay, so so one of the questions is what happens when you file a SAR? 
What does what does the government, what does FinCEN do with well, the data that's in the SAR? FinCEN acts as a clearinghouse for all law enforcement agents. So the SAR is filed electronically. It'll be done online. Um, it has limited information in it. Um, it seems like a lot, but from an investigative standpoint, it's very limited. Um, what that does is it goes to FinCEN, and then from there, it populates a database. Um, and although you're only filing one suspicious activity um, report that may be um, defined on an originator that, that transferred a wire into you, um, there could be 10 more like it that you're unaware of that are from other institutions, um, from other houses. So that database will recognize that. And FinCEN's job is then to identify um, trends in the industry, trends in, in, that they identify in activity, suspicious activity, and then forward that to the appropriate law enforcement authority, whether it be the IRS, the FBI, the Secret Service, are the primary uh, recipients of that information. But, but you know, I think uh, in, in, in your uh, uh, hypotheticals and so forth, Greg, I mean, you know, the SEC is obviously, uh, you know, going to be front and center in the right. uh, mix. And so, you, you know, you're looking at potential deficiency letters. You're looking at potential other, you know, problems that can be raised you know, during the exam. And as Walt's suggesting, some of it may be a, a second guessing or a look back as right. to particularly if something emerges as a problem that, you know, kind of passed through and wasn't screened or caught, so to speak. Now it's a post-mortem, and so you're going back and saying, well, what was done, was it, what wasn't done at that, that point, and, and the like. And again, the, the deficiency might be, uh, presumably, it would never be about the control structure and breakdown in, um, you know, the, the audit processes and other compliance processes, not necessarily that particular um, you know, uh, event that, that turns out to be, uh, you know, problematic. But what you're saying is there's almost no downside to the advisor filing an SAR. I mean, if they if they have even a scintilla of doubt, uh, even if they do their investigation, Walt, and they conclude that, well, you know, it's borderline, maybe we don't have to file this, there's really no reason for them to take that risk they should file. That, that's correct. I mean, I'm not the attorney here, but there's a safe harbor that protects the uh, the institution that's filing it, um, as well as the confidentiality that surrounds the filing of a SAR. Um, you know, regulators will look, and in this case, the SEC will look at who actually has access to the SAR. Um, so it's maintained at that level of confidentiality. Internally, there is a provision under the, the Patriot Act it, it, that to provide, um, you know, voluntary reporting to other peers in the industry. Um, that if there is a suspicious and identified individual that they filed a SAR on. But the SAR itself is still not shared with that third party. Well, let's talk about granularly inside the organization, right? I'm assuming the controller, mm -hmm. probably head of ops, would be involved in something like this. But would it go up to the CFO? Um, it, it, it depends upon the size of the organization, really, and um, what each individual's responsibilities are. You know, in a larger organization, it would never make it that level at all. Okay. Um, you know, in a smaller organization, it might possibly do so. Um, but it really comes down to on a need-to-know basis. Right. You know, the documentation itself is not classified, um, but you have to need to think about it as for official use only type of classification. So it's on a need-to-know basis. Um, so if your operations manager happens to be the person who's generating the alerts and he's handing you the reports, he knows that you have you know, some duty to resolve this. Um, but you'll have somewhere in there a staff or someone that's responsible for reviewing these alerts to make that determination. Um, ideally, the, the determination as to whether following that SAR happens or not, the SEC will come in and they'll look for, you know, some dual control in that. So it's not just one person making a decision, but it might be your compliance officer. Um, and then there's someone that's working below the compliance officer who has originated and then sent it in for recommendation. Now, what Greg, Greg, just, for, just for, I mean, I think the stakes are highest when it's an emergency situation. So when right. we talk about, you know, looking at it, doing investigation, filing within 30 days, et cetera. But there are, you know, scenarios where uh, if it's suspected terrorist financing, you know, you have a, a, a sort of, a, you know, just-in-time emergency obligation to file it. And that, that's where... And potentially it bubbles up through the organizational chain according to right. a mechanism that's in place for how to handle you know, those kinds of facts and circumstances. 
Well, again, you know my skepticism here. I can't see how an asset manager that's deciding on whether to buy fixed income or equity securities that are already in an account at a bank or a brokerage firm, how they could have an immediate terrorist funding concern. I mean, it it seems kind of far-fetched. Well, I think the only way – you're, you're right, but I mean, I think the only way – something like that could really happen without it being a complete miss early on right. with whoever had the original deposit account of this terrorist, right. okay, is going to be a change to an OFAC list. OFAC lists change on a daily basis as deemed necessary. So what you're saying is someone has pre-positioned clean money, right. and then all of a sudden... Well, it may not be clean money. It, it could be well, it, dirty you know, money. It looks cool. But they've right. now identified they're another... In the they're in the system. Yeah, they right. may have identified another individual an entity, right. it could be, you know, country or anybody. And uh, now they become part of a sanction. Um, I, I guess, you know, from the point of view of the advisor, especially the advisor who's new to this, right, they've never had to do it. Um, they've only done it tangentially because they have everybody else doing it for them. Right. Um, the big issue is they have to decide who in their organization is going to be responsible, whether it's a CFO or a chief compliance officer or a chief operating officer, number yeah. one. Number two, they need to decide who's in the circle. May not include the CEO, for example. Right. Um, and most likely, who's going to see you know, significant movements in an account that they're managing would be a portfolio manager who says, yesterday I had $100 million to deploy, today I have $200 million to deploy, you know, how that happened. Because remember, that money hasn't gone through the books of the advisor. The investment manager simply gets a feed from the broker-dealer that says, you know, uh, um, available balance to invest, $200 million, right? So the money has already gone through the brokerage banking whatever mm -hmm. system, and the investment manager simply gets a feed. So they're going to have to start deciding what's going on there, and is that a suspicious activity that they need to to report on. Now, most likely, they've been out beating the bushes and talking to their clients and asking their clients to increase their mandates, so they know where the money goes. Yeah. The one, the one word of caution I would uh, would add is all that makes sense. Um, where boards of directors get into trouble is when uh, there are exceptions made uh, or there's some kind of ongoing deviation uh, <laughs> that's some kind of uh, if you will, pattern. So there's always going to be some kind of maybe minor, uh, you know, issue that comes up, and it's not it's not material. But if there's some kind of expectation that there's a program in place and this is the way it's going to occur, and then uh, it's not even necessarily a quote rogue employee scenario, but just like oh well, we have to do it, you know, in the following you know, way, and there's a series of exceptions or some other process that's put in place. And that's not fully vetted, you know, all the way up through the, the organization. And it's not known. Uh, that's where boards of directors can get into the trouble because they're relying upon, you know, what they look at. So it, it sort of begs the question. I mean, obviously the boards are intended to do oversight. They don't micromanage, nor do they manage. But it does beg the question, do they look at it more than once a year? The, the good, you know, scenarios are they have the internal processes so that, you know, when something uh, is going off the tracks for whatever reason. It, it it does make its way up through the senior management, yeah. and then again, it's it's yeah. communicated yeah. as necessary. And, and I can I can add to that. Number one, your earlier question was who does the actual reporting, and I think it comes back to in this case, your compliance manager is going to be the one that interfaces with the FCC when they come knocking at your door. So that person needs to have the most direct and immediate knowledge of what SARs were filed um, and the content and what drove the filing of that SAR. So I really believe that the signatory line on that SAR should be that of the compliance officer in this case. Um, in terms of the board's knowledge, you know, when your board of directors meet, whether that be quarterly or whatever the frequency may be, as part of that reporting package, the chief compliance officer should be reporting to the board what the number of SARs were filed during that quarter um, and if there was any specific trends um, as well as part of that would determine if any events were filed on internal personnel uh, as opposed to clients. So that's an interesting point, filing on internal personnel. Mm -hmm. So you now have to watch your own people. Um, there was an uh, interesting statement in the release, and for those of you reading along at home for just the fun of it, 
it accompanies footnote 18 in the release, which suggests that um, uh, money laundering is defined in part with respect to the proceeds of certain predicate crimes referred to as, quote, specified unlawful activities. Securities fraud is specified unlawful activity. Both securities fraud and the act of laundering the proceeds of securities fraud are destructive to investors, individual businesses, and the financial system as a whole. The crime of money laundering also encompasses the movement of funds to finance terrorism, individual terrorists or terrorist organizations. These funds may be from illegitimate or legitimate sources. So one of the questions is securities fraud um, includes the uh, common law fraud of insider trading. Um, Rule 10b-5 is the basis for insider trading prosecutions. And so the question becomes, does an advisor now have an additional burden to watch for insider trading, and then when the proceeds of that insider trading start to be reinvested, have to file an SAR? And then the fact that we just double down on their normal supervisory responsibilities. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple couple points to be made. One is, uh, you know, what constitutes money laundering is more than just terrorist finance, and that's sort of what this uh, this is driving at. Um, and, and in kind of you know common English terms, non legal terms, you know, people would think of money laundering at in terms of you know, quote unquote cleaning the, the money from a uh, you know illicit operation in some some fashion. Well, it's that, but it's not just that. The way money laundering is defined. In the U.S. Is, is much broader than that. Again, there's certain more esoteric arrangements that you would imagine never hit, you know, this scenario. You know, kidnapping and other such things being the predicate for crimes, and there's a sting operation type things that uh, you're separate apart from this, again, that are sort of very far, you know, far afield. But, you know, when you, you know, start looking at predicate crimes of securities fraud or health care fraud or other such things, it shows you the you know the breadth of the uh, of uh, what constitutes uh, you know money laundering. Now there's certain parameters under the uh, criminal code. I believe it's the uh, I think it's a five year uh, time period uh, for the securities fraud as a punishment of, uh, of five years, I believe. So that you know may segment it uh, some. But yes, I mean the point is that uh, securities fraud is you know one of the things that. Uh, you could be uh, prosecuted uh, as a money laundering offense, and, and doubly so, you know, when the when the proceeds are, um, you know, being uh, pushed through the system. Yeah, pushed through the system. Yeah. Um, the FinCEN's risk assessment regarding types of advisory accounts. Um, I think that's a useful uh, slide for those of you following along. Slide 12: uh, Registered open end mutual funds, lower risk. Uh, registered closed end funds, lower risk private funds client, and unregistered pooled investment vehicle. Uh, yes, they have risks that vary and therefore expect covered advisors to assess the money laundering and ter terrorist financing risk associated with underlying investors. RAP fee programs, um, certain circumstances, these types of advisory services may provide issues for covered RIAs to have complete access to information, but nevertheless, the advisor is expected to use the information accessible to it to identify money laundering, et cetera. The one that's most interesting is the non-pooled investment vehicle clients. FinCEN views these as high-risk clients, and a covered RIA's assessment of the risk presented by the advisory services to these types of clients should take into account the types of accounts offered, the types of clients opening such accounts, and how the accounts are funded. So institutional separate accounts are viewed by FinCEN as the highest risk in this scenario which um, is very interesting, uh, especially when you consider that institutional accounts are always held at a custodian bank or broker. And uh, that, you know, is kind of a, an interesting assessment there. Um, the other uh, point we want to make, and we only have a couple minutes left, is the logistics. Um, the implementation date, the FinCEN is proposing that covered RIAs must develop and implement their AML programs on or before six months following the effective date. Our guess is that sometime mid-2016. And then FinCEN has requested comments. Comments are due by November the 2nd. So for the good of the order, um, Tim, we have a couple of closing points. What are your thoughts on when this is actually going to 
truly be effective completely? Yeah, no, I uh, I think the world's changed for RAs. I mean, I think this is, um, you know, this is now uh, uh, the world that uh, they, they will live in. I think this is, you know, the, uh, the first uh, of a series of rules. Uh, Walt, a series? What else do you think we're going to get? Well, we're going to get a joint, joint rule eventually on... Uh, you know, CIP okay. from uh, FinCEN and and, uh, and the SEC. Uh, we're uh, likely to get a joint rule from FinCEN and the SEC on the customer due diligence uh, requirements once they to sort that out. Otherwise, and they'll bring it forward uh, in this uh, area. Uh, they indicated in the proposal that they'll look at other parts of the Patriot Act uh, that they haven't covered already, uh, including perhaps some of these correspondent banking account uh, uh, areas. So, I mean, I think this may be a multi-year uh, effort, I mean, like four or five years uh, before, you know, all this rulemaking uh, is, you know, proposed and finalized and, and, and sorted through. And I think there also will be a feedback loop from the uh, compliance exams, uh, um, you know, from the SEC and, you know, they'll bring that to bear in terms of what they like and what they don't like and, and push that through as uh, possible uh, other changes. How about you, Walt? Any closing thoughts? Well, I, I think there will be additional changes, CIP being one, really through further definition. I mean, they're telling you today that they're preparing to launch an AML program. And I mean, I don't know how they can have, uh, I don't know how they can actually have an AML program without CIP um, as a, a significant component of that. Whether the funds are coming directly from a client or if they're coming from another institution. In that instance, you may be required then to have performed appropriate due diligence as a correspondent bank would on, on that institution and understand intimately what their AML program is. Um, and so I think you will see these other changes. Um, and I think they'll occur. Uh, you, you'll probably see more documentation coming out requiring you know, additional components that's kind of building out what an AML program truly is. Because what they've already announced is not completely an AML program. Well, uh, we're at the top of the hour, and I want to thank you for your attention and uh, hope to see you next month. Um, same time, uh, same location. This is Greg Novak for Pepper Hamilton. Thank you again.